I'm sure you've heard by now that the war in Ukraine has changed how we're going to conduct warfare forever, right? Tanks are obsolete is a popular one that's always floating around, but it's just not the case or not exactly or not right now, at least. I mean, there are a ton of lessons to be taken away for any military around the world to watch what's happening in Ukraine and implement that into their technologies and strategies going forward. But it's important that we take away the right lessons and don't overreact in one direction or another. Now, there's a recent article that hit on this in Foreign Affairs titled Back in the Trenches, Why New Technologies Has Not Revolutionized Warfare in Ukraine. They talk about some of the major changes, right? The advent of drone warfare, the mass drone warfare that we're seeing over the battlefields, artificial intelligence, all sorts of things like that. But they say in many ways, this war seems quite familiar. It features foot soldiers slogging through muddy trenches and scenes that look more like World War I than Star Wars. Its battlegrounds are littered with minefields that resemble those from World War II and feature moonscapes of shell holes that could be mistaken for Flanders in 1917. Conventional artillery has fired millions of unguided shells, so many as to strain the production capacity of the industrial bases in Russia and the West. And I want to hit on this artillery piece for a second because a lot of the footage that ends up circulating across social media that most of us see, right, our, our view into this war are these one-shot kills, right? There's a, a, a Russian tank that catches one 155 millimeter artillery round, usually an Excalibur type guided munition, and it's destroyed, right? Direct hit, tanks out of action, end of story. And we, we tend to take those and assume that that is how the war is being fought. But it's just not. The vast majority of artillery fire, which is largely causing most of the casualties in the war, and they're going to get into that here in a minute, is, is unguided, dumb round. I mean, if you look at a, a recent publication from the Pentagon talking about aid that's been sent to Ukraine, it was just a few months ago, I want to say in July, they said they had sent uh, 2 million rounds of 155 ammunition to Ukraine and 7,000 rounds of guided 155 millimeter ammunition. So jumping into some of the statistics here, pointing out, you know, why what we're seeing in Ukraine is not all that different from previous conflicts. They start with the tank. They say many revolutionists see heavy tank casualties in Ukraine as the key indicator for the tank's looming obsolescence in the face of newly lethal precision anti-tank weapons. This argument is all over the place and has been happening since the, the first days of the war. They say, but in the first 350 days of the war, uh, Russia lost somewhere between 1,688 and 3,253 tanks. So the first number is from Oryx, and the second number is from the Ukrainian Defense Ministry. For a loss rate, a Russian tank loss rate, of 50 to 96% of what was believed to be in their inventory before the war started. Ukraine, on the other hand, fielded about 900 tanks at the beginning of the invasion and has lost, again according to Oryx, 459 in the first 350 days for a loss rate of 51%. So on the low side for Russia, 50%, high side, 96%, Ukraine, 51%. But if you go back to World War II, they say, in 1943, the loss rate for German tanks was 113%. Germany lost more tanks than it owned at the beginning of the year. In 1944, Germany lost 122% of the tanks with which it started the year. The Soviet Union's loss rates for tanks in 1943 and 1944 were nearly as high, 109% and 80%. And I don't think there are very many people in 1943, 1944 saying the tank is now obsolete. I don't know. I'm sure there were some. It'd be interesting to go back and see all the people who said, you know, this was clearly a weapon for the last war and technologies have advanced and it's no longer useful. The loss rates were essentially double. And if you get into pure number of tanks destroyed, I'm certain that the Soviet Union lost more tanks in 43 and 44, as well as Germany, than either Ukraine or Russia did in the first year of this war. So in terms of overall quantity and a percentage of their overall force, I mean, it looks like tanks maybe were obsolete back in World War II, right? Now, one of the major challenges to the tank piece, at least, that I always point to, is if tanks are so obsolete, then why are Ukrainian and Russian forces so adamant about getting more of them? Right? They're the ones actually having to fight this war. They're the ones on the ground feeling the effects of these new anti-tank weapons. If those weapon systems are no longer relevant on the modern battlefield, why are the people waging this war always seeking more of that platform? So I don't know. Maybe the tank isn't completely finished yet. They also get into aircraft, right? Saying some have suggested that modern anti-aircraft missiles are so lethal to traditional piloted aircraft that these two are headed to the ash heap of history. So no more piloted aircraft. The surface air threat is too significant or air to air threat. It's all going to be drones going forward. They say the Ukrainian Air Force has lost at least 68 aircraft or more than one third of Ukraine's pre-war fleet. The Russian Air Force has lost more than 80 of its pre-invasion inventory of 2,204 military aircraft. And again, heading right back to World War II, 
They say in 1943, the German Luftwaffe lost 251% of the aircraft it had at the beginning of the year. 251%. Its loss rate for 1944 is even higher. In the first half of the year alone, it lost 146% of its January strength. The Soviet loss rate for aircraft was 77% in 1943 and 66% in 1944. Now, one thing that has to be mentioned here is the, the, the time that it takes to produce modern aircraft versus what we're rolling off the assembly line in World War II. It's vastly different. The cost is vastly different, even adjusted for inflation. Like they're substantially more expensive and time consuming and resource intensive to create these modern aircraft. So I think that might give us the sense that they're not supposed to be destroyed as fast or that these loss rates of, you know, more than one third of Ukraine's pre-war fleet is unsustainable. And, you know, if that's the case, then maybe we need to look at how much time and money are going into producing these aircraft. If, if the losses in this war are viewed as changing the landscape of how aircraft are going to be used going forward in the future, and they're not even, not even comparable to loss rates in World War II, I don't know. I, I, sometimes there's an argument for uh, being able to churn out more of something at a lower cost. And, and maybe, maybe that's some of what this is getting at here. Then getting into artillery. So my favorite piece here, they say since at least 1914, artillery has inflicted more casualties in major wars than any other weapon. And today, some observers believe that as many as 80 to 90% of Ukrainian casualties have been caused by artillery fire. I've heard that stat, same thing, 80 to 90%. It, it probably checks out, right? There's, there's a lot of small arms fire, um, but with the, the volume of artillery fire against Ukrainian positions throughout this war, that, that number 100% passed the common sense test. They mentioned, like I did previously, that the vast majority of rounds being used in this war are unguided, right? It's just a tiny, tiny fraction that are laser or some type of GPS guidance included. And they get into some statistics, kind of pointing back to a previous conflict here as well. And, you know, take this one with a grain of salt, because I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of numbers used in this one that I don't know are perfectly dialed in, right? But it should give us at least an idea. So they say, if one assumes, however, that 85% of Russian casualties are caused by Ukrainian artillery, which again, given the volume of artillery fire, I think that's relatively, it could be relatively accurate. And that Russia suffered as many as 146,820 casualties in the first year of the invasion. That is coming from the Ukrainian defense ministry. Probably think of that as being on the high side. And that Ukraine fired a total of around 1.65 million rounds of artillery in the first year. That is from the Brookings Institute. I haven't actually seen a number, uh, for that, so we'll, we'll go with it. I, I can't definitively say that's high or low. They say then drones in the mix of guided and unguided artillery in the Ukrainian army inflicted on average about eight Russian casualties per hundred rounds fired in the first year of the invasion. That rate exceeds the World War rates, but not by much. So they say that in World War II, it was about three casualties for every hundred rounds fired. In World War I, it was about two soldiers wounded or killed per hundred rounds fired. So of all the ones we're gonna get into, the artillery is the one where to me at least, there's the most evidence that there's been major changes, but I don't know what that figure would have to be to say that it's completely changed how warfare is done, right? If, if we say it jumps from three to, again, probably rounding down to six, so it doubled over the last 80 years, I don't think that would shock anybody, right? The effectiveness of artillery, the, you know, tying in the use of drones to, to better identify targets and actually shoot at places where the enemy is located, that, that sounds about right. More effective artillery. But again, I don't know that those numbers necessarily reflect like a major change in how warfare is going to be conducted. They also push back on something that I really haven't heard much of at all, but it's, I guess, the idea that offensive warfare is dead. Maneuver warfare is a thing of the past because of these new lethal weapons. Again, I haven't really heard that argument. Apparently, it's out there or in some circles being debated. So they bring it up here and it's where, you know, I'll go ahead and, and tell you why they think that's that's not relevant. They talk about how Russia's initial invasion of February 2022 was poorly executed in many ways. I think that's safe to say at this point. Yet it gained over 42,000 square miles of ground in less than a month. Fair. Ukraine's Kyiv counteroffensive then retook over 19,000 square miles in March and early April. Ukraine's Kherson counteroffensive in August 2002 eventually gained almost 470 square miles. And its Kharkiv counteroffensive in September retook 2,300 square miles. I think this is... If, if there's anybody arguing this, that offensive warfare is a thing of the past or maneuver warfare is a thing of the past, I think it's that we get too stuck. You know, we see maybe updates in the battlefield over the last month in one sector of a giant war and say, that's it. Armies can't go on the offensive anymore. There's too many minefields, too many ATGMs. It, it, it can never happen. Uh, again, not an argument I've really heard presented, and I, I'd be a little skeptical if anybody decided to die on that hill. 
if you will. Moving on, they say new technologies do matter when it comes to the lessons that we can take away from this conflict, but the adaptations that armies have increasingly adopted since 1917 dramatically dampen its effects and outcomes. Precision weapons that are devastating on the proving ground or against exposed mass targets yield much lower casualty rates against dispersed concealed forces. And this was something I heard in a podcast recently when they were actually the, the topic was troop morale, uh, but they were talking about how the Ukrainian forces that they were embedded with at the time are so spread out because of the risk of being consolidated and exposed to Russian artillery fire that you could even talk to you know one company and they're spread out over such a wide area that they have entirely different experiences of the war. One company, that's generally a hundred or so soldiers. So you would think that in an organization that small, very tight knit, right? You know, so many people have seen uh, Band of Brothers in World War II that's focused on on one company. Right? And that whole company was so tight-knit, they all knew each other. But the way this war is being fought right now is that one company, while in the rear and you know moving from one location to another, might be consolidated. When they're actually out there on the front, they are so dispersed over such a large area that there's kilometers or tens of kilometers even between one position and another. You know That whole thing, the reason that a company like that is so dispersed is to minimize the effectiveness of some of these modern weapons. You know, if Russia identifies one location, they're not going to be able to wipe out an entire company with a massed artillery strike. They say this combination of ever more lethal technology but ever more dispersed and concealed targets has produced far less net change in realized outcomes over time than one would expect by looking only at the weapons and not at their interaction with human behavior. That's this whole cat, cat and mouse game. Right? It was the reason that people were digging trenches in World War I. Right? They were just moving across open terrain, and then everything above ground was killing you. Right, Artillery, shrapnel, and you, it didn't make sense to be above ground, so they went down. They adapted. It's no different in any conflict. It's human nature, and it, it's one of those things that's very hard to account for in the testing of these weapon systems, but we can see it playing out right now in Ukraine. So the reason the authors are pushing back on this, and what I think is a really good point, is that we have to make the correct judgments from this conflict so that we're better prepared whenever we find ourselves in a future large-scale war. They say, if warfare is being revolutionized, as some of these people are advocating, then the traditional incremental updating of ideas and equipment is insufficient and something more radical is needed. Tanks, for example, should be mothballed, not modernized. This is actually one of those times where it's beneficial that our government moves so slow and that our Defense Department moves so slow at times, right? We are not good at turning on a dime and making some rapid change. So fortunately, you know, after a bunch of tanks were destroyed in Ukraine in the first few months of the war, there wasn't a push to, or a legitimate push to scrap all of our tanks rather than modernize them. We have the time because the bureaucracy moves so slow to, to watch this play out over time and make a more informed decision as to the future of warfare. Because it's important. Again, we don't want to mothball all of our tanks because of what happened in one conflict over the course of 30 days, right? And kind of wrapping up here, they say, in ter and in terms of these ideas of major transformations, the, the article wraps up here saying the war in Ukraine to date offers little support for such ideas. And I think they nailed it with his last piece here saying, it has been almost 110 years since the tank was introduced in 1916. Some have argued that the tank is obsolete because of technological improvements in anti-tank weapons. This argument has been commonplace for over 50 years or almost half the entire history of the tank. Yet in 2023, both sides in Ukraine continue to rely on tanks and are doing everything they can to get their hands on more of them. So again, kind of the big summary here is everything is imperfect. Everything needs to improve. The armor on tanks is a world different than when tanks first came about in World War I and not even comparable to the tanks of World War II, right? So kind of, sort of, it's the same thing that it's been over the last 110 years, but just in concept. Right? They adapt. The armor adapts. The targeting technology adapts. The survivability, the mobility, all of those things have changed to keep up with the modern battlefield. And the big takeaway here that the authors are getting at, I think it's a great point that they really dial in on, is give it time. Nothing that we've seen so far warrants a drastic overhaul in how the U.S. or any nation is preparing for war. Maybe that'll come. It hasn't yet. Don't overreact. Take the little lessons learned and make ourselves a little bit better, a little more adaptable for whenever the next conflict comes. But that's all I got for now. I will link this article as well as the national security sit reps I put out on Substack in the description below. That's you know seven to 10 of the most important national security stories that week with podcast recommendations. But thanks for watching and I'll see y'all next time.